Good morning. Today for a summary theme, I'd like to use how do we stand up? How do we stand up? Rosa Parks in 1955 was on a segregated bus. The way that public transportation worked in the 50s, where she lived, is that everyone paid the same price, but black sat in the back of the bus and the white sat in the front. If the bus became full and a white person got on, then the black person had to give up their seat and let that white person sit down. That was how it worked in the South and the Middle East. Rosa Parks was a secretary and she had a convenient sit-down job. Standing being tired was not the issue. But there were lots of black women house workers that traveled on public transportation to get to their job that required them to work hard all day cleaning house, cooking meals, and taking care of families. So much so that some of them rarely saw their own families. But that, again, was not Ms. Rosa Parks' situation, and the story sometimes gets told wrongly. The bus was filling up, and a white passenger came up to Rosa Parks and asked her to go. Rosa Parks did not move. Rosa Parks, on that day, stood up to racial segregation in the South. I know she must have been scared, because people standing up to injustice were getting killed. People standing up to injustice were getting beat to a pole. People were easily losing their lives for standing up to segregation in the South. So I imagine standing up was not easy for Rosa Parks. Today we get to the biblical text where God stands up on behalf of the marginalized Hagar and her son. Hagar first becomes known to us as Sarah's maidservant in the household of Abraham. Now Sarah couldn't get pregnant. Today, through science, we know a little bit more about women and the complexity sometimes of being able to get pregnant. But Sarah came up in a time when all of that research was not available. God had promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations, and Sarah couldn't get pregnant. Now back in the day, it's fairly common when you were unable to conceive, you could use a maid servant to conceive for you. This was not totally out of the ordinary. We call it surrogacy today. The idea was put into motion by Sarah, and Hagar becomes pregnant the good old-fashioned way by Abraham having sex with her. Well, wouldn't you know it? What happens to Sarah when <laughs> Hagar gets pregnant? She gets jealous, even though it was her idea in the first place. But about this time, Sarah also gets pregnant. She realizes now she's going to have her own baby, and now she doesn't need the child that Hagar is about to give birth to. Sarah starts to treat Hagar badly. The text doesn't go into detail, but we can imagine Sarah making life hard for Hagar. Sarah then asked Abraham to kick her and her son out. So she needed Hagar until she didn't. And when she didn't, she aimed all of her pain towards this victim and then asked Abraham to get rid of her. A fishing boat about 100 feet of long that generally carries 600 to 700 people referred to as a floating coffin, sailed from Libya this week, headed towards Greece. This boat was carrying up to 700 Pakistani, Syrian, Egyptian, and Palestinian refugees and migrants. Five bodies died on board from just the catastrophe of being in the ocean with little water and heat. 24 were hospitalized. 78 bodies they have found. 104 people were rescued. Survivors are in shock. Some of you may have seen the imagery of this boat with 700 people on it. Do the math, we still have a lot of people that are missing. 
The people on the boat are blaming the Greek authorities, saying they pulled the boat too fast, and that's what brought on the disaster. But Greece is saying it was notified by Italian authorities of the travelers' presence in international waters. It said efforts by its own ships and merchant vessels came to assist the boat, but were repeatedly rejected with people on board insisting they wanted to continue to Italy. Whose story shall we believe? Does it really matter? We are witnessing one of the biggest tragedies in the Mediterranean, and the numbers announced by the authorities are devastating. The IOM has recorded more than 21,000 deaths and disappearances in central Mediterranean since 2014. Many countries, including our own, hold shockingly hostile feelings to those fleeing poverty and danger. I was listening to a member share that she sometimes, when she sits down on a couch, she finds it hard to get up. The other day, she found herself at the end of a visit, unable to get up. Can anybody relate to that story? The couch perhaps was too far down and too far back, and she had gotten comfy, <laughs> and she didn't have the physical ability to get herself off the couch without some assistance. I imagine that sometimes the call of being a Christian can be like that, that sometimes we get comfortable. Sometimes we get so comfortable like Abraham, we are reluctant to intervene. But when we see people dying, when we see people kicked out, when we see others struggling, <coughs> when others discriminate against others, rather than get stuck on the couch, should we be willing to stand up against wrong and extend a helping hand to those who suffer? Our faith calls us to embrace the values of justice and kindness. We're to help those marginalized. We have a responsibility to act when we witness mistreatment and injustice. So, how do we stand up? How do we get off the couch? You can scoot off the couch, can you? You can ask for help to get to your feet. You can keep trying. I've watched seniors figure it out. And somehow they find a way to get up off the couch, no matter how hard it is. It may take some struggle and some problem solving, but most of us manage to get off the couch. And then they remember, hmm, maybe I shouldn't sit there again. Or maybe if I come over to this person's house, I should sit on the edge of the couch. Or maybe I should sit in a totally different chair we can support others doing the work. How do we stand up? By supporting others. How do we stand up? By volunteering like many of us already do. How do we stand up? We can write letters. How do we stand up? We can make phone calls. We can use our voices to express our righteous indignation about what is happening in our world. Join the choir and get louder. Each of our denominations have multiple ways that we can become involved. Lastly, we can take action. One person. Rosa Parks was one person. And that ignited something. But some of you heard of Claudette Coleman, who six months earlier also stood up to injustice on the bus by refusing to give her seat up. On behalf of Hagar, God had to speak. God had to say, girl, I got your back. Girl, this is wrong. God had to let her know, you're going to be okay. God, in the absence of humans who are silent, including Abraham, has to stand up. God says, look, I hear the cries of your son. God saw her dilemma, and God saw what was happening. They might have completed a chapter on your life, but this is not the end of your book. There is room in the world for you and your son. We don't get to throw away folks we no longer have use for. If we can care for five in a submarine, we can care for 700 on a ship. If we can care about Sarah's child, we can care about Hagar's son. If we can create stellar education for the kids in this district, 
we can create good education for the kids that live on the here. If we can obsess about the rich, certainly we can care about the poor. If we can glow about Johnny, certainly we can care about Khalil. God says, I see you, Hagar. I see your son. I got you. God stands up. In school, they used to write these stories to help you with your vocabulary. And then there would be this sentence and a blank. And you got the list of vocabulary words, and with each sentence, there was a blank. You were supposed to use the appropriate word based on the context of the sentence. There's a blank. It's time for us to insert our names on the blank lines of this present moment in history. Whether we're the paper for the spark, whether we're the spark for the fire, or whether we're the fire all by itself. I'm not going to miss my child. If God is for us, who can be against us? For God, I live and God, I'll die. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. What does the Lord require of us to act just and to love mercy? And to walk humbly with our God. Let justice roll down like a river. Righteousness like a never falling stream. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for my righteousness. For they will be filled. Blank lines. Insert your name. Insert our story. I, you, we are vessels of God. I'm available to you, O oh Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. My hands and my feet, my will, Lord, I give to you. I'll do what you say, do. Use us, Lord. Insert your name on the blank pages of the sentences that we are writing. Lord, we stand up. Today I began with the story of one person. Sometimes we can feel like our story and our journey and our choices don't matter, but they do. Even now, your choices in your journey matter. Rosa Parks' choice to stand up inspired others to stand up. Those housewives that were going to those homes weren't thinking about no protest. They weren't thinking about fighting those system. She couldn't have known, nor the civil rights movement, that her actions would lead to a mass movement. A fire was ignited, and right away Montgomery formed a community boycott for 381 days. You want to get people's attention, impact them in their pockets. It put immense pressure on the city's authorities, and it drew what national attention. The house workers suddenly who needed public transportation organized and found ways and people volunteered to carpool to get all those ladies to work for 381 days. Ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation on public bus buses was unconstitutional, making a significant victory for the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks' story serves as a powerful reminder that one person's actions can ignite a movement and bring about change in our world. Stand up. What you gonna do? Stand up. Whatever it takes, Roll off that couch and stand up. Amen. Amen.